One Lens once again coming to you from the NerdPad Dungeon, deep below the depths of the crawl space. Now in this episode, we're going to be looking at my all-time favorite horror movie to date. The big one. The one that inspired me to do videos, the one that inspired me to act, the one that inspired me to write. I'm talking about The Evil Dead, starring Bruce Campbell. Everyone's favorite actor. Everyone's favorite cheesy actor. Now this movie was a pretty big one for me. I practiced acting like Bruce Campbell in front of the mirror when I was 16, 17, and 18. I wanted to be Bruce Campbell back then. I wanted to make a movie like Evil Dead. Evil Dead blew my fucking mind. It never left my PlayStation 2 back in 2002 through 2004. Somewhere around there. Somewhere around there. But yeah. Without further ado, let's look at my review for The Evil Dead. Well, it's 2015, and after Bruce Campbell's long journey as Ash Williams from movies to comic books to video games, he's back in the new Star series, Ash vs. the Evil Dead. This being the first year of the Metal Spider Horrorthon, and Evil Dead to date is still my most influential DVD in my collection, it's only fitting that we take a look at this bloody, gory masterpiece. Behind the Evil Dead's grotesque and revolting displays of horror lies one of the greatest filmmaking stories of all time, of a group of friends who set out to make one of the most shocking movies ever made and have a great experience in the process. The film would lead to lifelong careers in movies and television for their creator and director Sam Raimi, who also directed the original Spider-Man trilogy, Darkman, and Drag Me to Hell, Rob Taper, who went on to produce movies like The Grudge 1 and 2, 30 Days of Night, and even the Evil Dead remake of 2013, and last but not least, Bruce Campbell, who plays the Evil Dead's main protagonist and also starred in movies like Bubba Hotep, which is also a great movie where he plays a fantastic Elvis. A ton of cheesy sci-fi channel quality B-movies, but also starred in some great television shows like Burn Notice, Hercules The Legendary Journeys, Xena Warrior Princess, which were also helmed by Sam Raimi and Rob Tapert, and was also the main star on the show The Adventures of Briscoe County Jr. I had to mention that one. I have to mention I was pleasantly surprised when I found out that Bruce Campbell was the Dodge Challenger in Cars 2, and deeply satisfied whenever he'd reprise his role as Ash in the video games for various game consoles. Before the trio could release Evil Dead, they were going to need some better fundage, so what came first was an extremely low-budget prototype called Within the Woods. I bought it on a VCD along with many other college project videos Sam and Bruce did back in the early years. To me back then, this thing was like the holy grail. The short film was shot on a budget of 1600 bucks and filmed with an 8mm camera. Sam Raimi's intentions were to use Within the Woods to snag investors and raise money for a bigger and better film, which would be The Evil Dead. Raimi convinced a local theater manager to show Within the Woods with the Rocky Horror Picture Show in 1978, and although the audience loved it, each of the cast only received 10 bucks, which they were forced to donate to the American Cancer Society due to the use of a song in the film that had a copyright issue. So even before YouTube was giving us problems with copyright crap, it was happening in the 70s with independent filmmakers. Nice. Within the Woods stars Bruce Campbell as Bruce and Ellen Sandweiss as Bruce's girlfriend. Both will later star in the Evil Dead as Ash and Cheryl, who are changed to brother and sister. Bruce, Ellen, and their friend Scotty, played by Scott Spiegel, and Shelley, played by Mary Valenti, travel to an old house for a vacation, and once settled in, Bruce and Ellen decide to go on a picnic and soon discover that they're picnicking on an old Indian burial ground. To summarize, the spirits become angered for being disturbed and Bruce becomes possessed, becoming the main antagonist of this feature and attempts to kill his girlfriend and friends. Within the Woods contains many scenes and concepts that would later be reused in Evil Dead 1 and 2, including the trademark Raimi cam, the evil force that relentlessly roams through the woods, human possessions, the use of dialogue, join us, and the unforgettable scene of Shelly chewing through her wrist and throwing her own hand away after Scotty wasn't able to cut through it all the way, was a concept that was created in Within the Woods, and those similarities are only the name of few. I'd really love to talk more about Within the Woods, and maybe I'll do a horror review of it by itself sometime, but we really need to move on. Sam Raimi wanted $150,000 to make The Evil Dead, but was only able to raise 90000 of it and decided to go forth and film the movie anyway. And in 1981, we'd all be introduced to one of the greatest and bloodiest horror movies of all time. Sam Raimi once said on the set of The Evil Dead that he wants to torture the audience. Let that statement set the tone in your heads about what we're about to view. Evil Dead opens with the evil force roaming through an ominous-looking swamp. There's so much great imagery in this scene, the trees 
They're either barren of leaves or have leaves that have turned color, indicating the fall season. There's fog and bubbling water, down trees, and even a partially submerged car, giving the audience the impression that no one leaves this region. We're soon introduced to our main characters who are on their way to a remote cabin for vacation in the classic 1973 Oldsmobile Delta 88. The five nearly meet their fate early as they narrowly miss getting hit by an oncoming truck. The evil force is seemingly responsible since we see it roaming towards them in the shot prior before we see the steering wheel spin wildly from the control of Scotty, played by actor Hal Delrick, which was revealed by Bruce Campbell on the 2002 DVD commentary that was just a stage name. Soon after, they come to a rickety old bridge which begins breaking in areas under the weight of that Detroit muscle. They arrive at the cabin which to date is one of the most eerie and appropriate locations for a horror movie of all time. I mean, we're really using all time in this video, aren't I? <laughs> They're greeted by a chain-suspended bench swinging back and forth wildly, slamming against the outer wall of the cabin despite the absence of wind, another concept that was used in Within the Woods. While Scotty inspects the cabin, we, the audience, are treated to sets that were arranged as homages to a few of Sam Raimi's favorite horror movies and directors, such as The Hanging Bones and Gourds, which were inspired by Toby Hooper's Texas Chainsaw Massacre from 1974, and later in the basement, a torn Hills Have Eyes poster can be seen in the cellar, which was a bit of friendly horror competition between Raimi and the late Wes Craven, over whose movies were more terrifying. As a result of this, Wes Craven shot a scene for the 1984 classic, A Nightmare on Elm Street, where the main character Nancy is watching The Evil Dead on her television. While the group wind down and begin to settle in, strange things begin to happen, starting with Cheryl, played by Ellen Sandweiss, who if you recall from the beginning of this video, played Bruce's girlfriend in Within the Woods. As Cheryl practices drawing by sketching a clock, the evil makes its presence known as it forces Cheryl to scribble a picture of a creepy looking book, moments before it pops open the cellar door a few times. Naturally, Cheryl would tell the others and is met with ridicule by Scotty until the cellar door bursts open while the group sits down to dinner, forcing them to investigate. It's a creepy door, it popped open, gotta go investigate. Scotty decides to venture on into the cellar while Ash follows soon after, after Scotty fails to answer Ash calling to him to see if he's okay. Ash and Scotty come across some interesting and plot-specific artifacts in the cellar, and this is where the talents of artist Tom Sullivan become apparent as he designed the Skull Dagger, as well as the most important and central part of the Evil Dead series, the Necronomicon Ex Mortis, the Book of the Dead. Bound in human flesh and inked in blood. It's an ancient Sumerian text that contains bizarre burial rites, funerary incantations, and demon resurrection passages. It was never meant for the world of the living. Even though the book has come to be known as the Necronomicon, it was originally referred to as Nacharam de Manto in the first two movies. Ash and Scotty also find an old school recorder and take it upstairs to listen to it and find that a professor had found the book and made a record of his findings and experiences with the book. In the sequels, a professor on the tape is known as Professor Raymond Noby. He admits on tape that the passages he's about to read will give the demons the power to possess the living. The tape is played and the passages are spoken aloud and the shit is about to hit the fan. But not before we get a somewhat cheesy love scene between Ash and his girlfriend Linda, played by Betsy Baker. Ash pretends to have fallen asleep with a jewelry box in his hand, sparking Linda's curiosity. Playful looks are exchanged and Linda receives her gift from her loving boyfriend, which turns out to be a magnifying glass pendant necklace. The necklace almost serves as a symbol of foreshadowing and the scene itself is almost like the calm before the storm. The final moments of peace and normalty before they each are pulled into a trip of unimaginable hell. While the others prepare for bed, Cheryl's curiosity gets the best of her and becomes compelled to take a stroll into the woods, determined to find out who or what is causing the sounds and activities that continue to haunt her. And what Cheryl and we as the audience are greeted with is, to date, one of the strangest, sickest, and offensive scenes in any horror movie, and as a matter of fact, Three-fourths of the people I recommended The Evil Dead to couldn't make it past this scene, and it's one of the best examples of how Sam Raimi enjoys torturing and punishing his victims. The trees, now sentient and evil, develop a taste for Vag and begin to violently rape Cheryl, tearing at her clothes, pulling her every which way before finally being penetrated by the tree's wooden projectile penis. I guess. Cheryl struggles for her life and eventually is able to break free and make a run back to the cabin. Despite the grotesque and disgusting scenes that will come later, the tree rape scene remains the most uncomfortable and disturbing scenes in the movie and possibly the whole series. Cheryl is able to make it back to the others and once again is met with disbelief and criticism and convinces Ash to drive her to the nearest town and out of the woods. 
Retreated to a car won't start cliche with Cheryl declaring it won't start and won't let us leave. Ash starts the car and heads to the bridge only to find out that it has been ravaged and crumpled up, trapping them all in the forest and confining him to the cabin. While Ash listens to more of Noby's recordings, Linda plays a game of Guess the Car with Shelly, played by actress Sarah York, which is also a stage name. Cheryl begins guessing the cards a hell of a lot more accurately than Linda. With we the audience, Linda and Shelly suspicious of Cheryl's newfound psychic abilities, we soon get hit with this. Why have you disturbed our sleep? Awakened us from our ancient slumber. You will die! Like the others before you. One by one, we will take you. We now get a glimpse of what demon possession looks like. A chewed up epidermis and blank, lifeless white eyes, which were one of my favorite things about the look of the possessed people. In other words, deadites. The eyes were a special type of contact lens that were huge and painful to put in and would suffocate the eyes, meaning the actors and actresses can only wear them for about 15 minutes at a time, meaning shots would have to be taken quickly with limited room to fuck up. The contact lenses also prevented the actors from seeing, meaning that any scene that required them to take a swing or stab at any of the non-possessed fellow actors were doing it blindly and actually putting them in harm's way for the sake of the scene. A rare case where the filming and acting could be seen as more terrifying than the actual movie they were in. Cheryl begins attacking everyone, stabbing Linda in the foot with a pencil and throwing Ash across the room into a bookcase. Scotty shows some balls and strikes Cheryl in the face and locks her in the cellar. At this point in the movie, we're not really supposed to root for Ash, but the directors try to establish Scotty as the brave, no-bullshit hero of the story, who has what it takes to survive. Keep in mind it's the first movie, so Ash's character definitely rapidly develops drastically through the series from this point. With Linda sleeping and Cheryl locked in the cellar, the remaining three begin formulating a plan of escape. That is, until Scotty takes Shelly to get some rest. This is where the movie really begins giving me the impression that people only become possessed when they're all alone, as Shelly soon falls victim to this while looking out her bedroom window after she's away from Ash and Scotty. The evil force breaks the window and Shelly screams inciting Scotty to investigate the bedroom and bathroom while Ash sits on the couch. It doesn't take long before the extremely shitty looking Shelly pops out and attacks Scotty leading to a few cheesy puppetry type effects after Scotty throws her into the fireplace followed by some impressively terrifying and sickening makeup effects. Thank you. I don't know what I would have done if I had remained on those hot Burning my pretty flesh. You have pretty skin. Give it to our The fight escalates and Ash is once again thrown into some bookshelves as Scotty is choked and forced into the fire. Scotty resists being burned but then is soon stabbed at with the skull dagger that is once again being wielded by a blind actress. In a desperate attempt to escape his possessed attacker, Scotty begins cutting through Shelly's wrist before Shelly finishes the job by gnawing through the rest of it and throwing the bloody, rotting, meaty hand to the floor. A scene originally featured in Within the Woods and gloriously reshot for this movie. Not wasting any time, Scotty picks up the skull digger with Shelly's hand still attached and stabs her in the prompting of one of the longest and most blood-curdling screams in film history. Followed by an explosive eruption of blood and milk from her mouth and wrists as she lay struggling and jerking around on the floor. Anyone would think the attack is over, but Demon Shelly isn't done and jumps up for more hellish fun. This scene is another example of who Ash was in this movie as he cowardly holds his axe in the corner, unresponsive and in shock over the nightmarish events that have been unfolding before him, with Scotty screaming, HIT HER! Finally, Scotty cuts the bullshit, grabs the axe, and relentlessly chops Shelly to pieces. It's a no-holds-barred, impressive display of mutilation, macabre, and gore. When I first saw this, I couldn't believe how brutal and gruesome this all was and how far the filmmakers are taking all of this and what they were actually able to get away with on screen. Blood envelops the screen and we cut to a grim shot of the aftermath. Bloody chunks and twitchy severed limbs. It's sickening, it's gross, it's nauseating, and it's just fucking incredible. The camera pans up to our heroes who at this point accept the finality and horror of what just happened and continue on to bury Shelly and then discuss the possibility of leaving the cabin. Scotty, having no reason to stay after cutting up his girlfriend, sets his heart on leaving with or without Ash, stating he doesn't care what happens with Ash's girlfriend, Linda, and that he's getting the hell out. Scotty makes like a tree and leaves and Ash finds himself alone and taunted by his possessed sister still locked in the cellar. 
soon, all of you will be like me. And then grow all of you up in a sour! <laughs> From here, things begin to fall apart even more for our hero, and faster as well, as Linda soon becomes possessed upon Ash checking up on her condition, and Scotty returns to the cabin beaten, torn up, and in an extremely critical shape. It's clear at this point that Scotty isn't going to make it, as Ash asks Scotty if there's another path other than the bridge to take. This scene perplexes me just a tiny bit due to one thing. The possessed Linda sits in the doorway and just laughs while Scotty dies, when in other scenes the possessed humans would attack with all piss and vinegar, but not here. Linda's laughter drives Ash to grow agitated and unleash a little domestic abuse on his possessed significant other. After a few Sean Connery style open hand slaps to the face, Ash attempts to kill her but is unable to and moments later Linda appears to have snapped out of being possessed, begging Ash not to let them take her again. Cheryl seems okay as well, talking in her normal voice and asking to come out from the cellar. Ash of course becomes gullible and moves to open the cellar and let his sister out when all of a sudden this happens. BOOM! Demonic sibling rivalry with some nice rotting meaty hand shoved right into Ash's mouth. With Linda and Cheryl back to their possessed states, they begin to taunt Ash once again. Ash pulls Linda outside after many failed demands to Linda to shut up. Scotty takes his final breaths, leaving Ash as the only one not to be possessed and faced with the challenge of survival against the evil. Pulling Linda outside to begin with proves to have been a futile effort as she makes her way back and lunges towards Ash with the skull dagger. Yet another scene where the attackee is in actual danger. I mean, look at the position he's in. It would have been very possible for Bruce Campbell to have gotten sliced or stabbed in this scenario. Finally, accepting the inevitability of the situation, Ash impales Linda but is unable to dismember her body, so instead opts to bury her out back, but soon discovers that burials aren't even enough to stop this evil. Linda rises from the dirt, more homely than ever, and ready for some more demonic, violent fun with Ash. At this point, you can tell a different actress stepped in to play the possessed Linda, as the movie was filmed between sometimes long periods of time due to financial troubles and life situations with the actors and actresses. However, it was never enough to kill the experience. Growing up, I always blamed any continuity errors like these on the nature of the evil force and how it can drastically change the physical appearance of any human being. Yeah, it's a cop-out, I know. Ash starts beating the shit out of Linda with one of the most realistic-looking styrofoam boards ever put to film. This is where the movie really begins to get messy as we get a nice spit shot that hits the lens and as Linda jumps to attack Ash, he counters her with a nice shovel decapitation, followed by an explosion of blood from her freshly cut neck to his freshly horrified face. As Ash re-enters the house, he finds Cheryl has escaped the cellar and is on the rampage. The audience is treated to more rotting and gory makeup effects after Ash shoots her through the window. In the scenes that follow, the events really begin to prey on the nerves and tensions of Ash as well as the audience. Ash descends into the cellar to retrieve more shotgun shells. A pipe bursts and hits Ash in the face with blood. Blood flows from the electric outlets from the walls. A light bulb fills with it. An old record player begins playing an old humorous sounding ragtime song. And an old projector turns on and eventually explodes. As Ash ascends the cellar, he's welcomed with more nerve damaging occurrences like the clock's time going in reverse at high speed. The window shutters slamming against the house. Creaks and cracks and footsteps being heard throughout and the liquid mirror. After everything we've endured in this movie, we finally get to see the finale, the ultimate grisly, ghastly payoff. Cheryl bursts her hands through the door and Ash blows a hole right in her face, and Scotty also returns possessed and rotting profusely. The blood and gore fly freely in the continuing scenes and is satisfying as hell to any horror enthusiast, I should say. Scotty and Cheryl begin attacking Ash as he desperately tries to reach for the Necronomicon, and using a symbol of his love, the necklace he bought for Linda, he's finally able to obtain it and throws it in the fire. From here we see some amazing stop motion decomposition effects as Scotty and Cheryl begin to rot upon the destruction of the book. There's so much happening in these scenes. Bones become exposed as flesh disintegrates, hair falls out, and there are so many different textures and colors, it's almost beautiful in a way. We also see the book make facial expressions as it burns in the fire. There is a brief calm moment before we get hit with one final explosive show of blood and gore, with huge claw-laden hands tearing through the abdomens and backs of Cheryl and Scotty, almost as if the demons inside them are trying to escape. Scotty begins rotting faster as Cheryl falls to the floor with her skull bursting on impact, showering Ash with blood, brains, and bone. The aftermath is one of the most revolting, repugnant, and nauseating scenes in film history. It's almost like a long, heavy night of drinking and partying, followed by one of the worst hangovers of all time. 
With the Necronomicon burned and the daylight breaking, it would seem as if the evil is vanquished. Or is it? So many people have questioned why I love this movie, why it remains my favorite, and maybe even question my sanity. But I'm not just in love with the movie, I'm in love with the story behind the movie, the lifelong journey of these men have taken together and how far their vision has gone. No matter where I go or how far I've come in life, I can't escape Evil Dead. It's not just a movie, but a phenomenon I've witnessed as a child and one I've revisited countless times throughout my life, and will continue to revisit well into my old age. Much how like Ash can't escape the evil and must accept his destiny and identity as a warrior against the undead, I'm destined to keep revisiting Evil Dead. Unlike the sequels that came after, the first Evil Dead remains the darkest and most serious film in the series with visuals that will haunt you long after you watch it. If you love horror and haven't seen the Evil Dead, you need to immediately. It's horror that holds up even to this day. Thanks for joining me. And stay tuned to the Metal Spider YouTube channel for more of these horror-thon episodes. I'm Glenn Lenz, once again coming to you from the NerdPad dungeon deep below the depths of the crawl space. Until then, sweet dreams.